Okay, so today we are talking about aircraft tires and tubes, um, chapter nine, section C. Um, the first thing that they talk about is what's known as tire classification. And for aviation, our book talks about three types of tires. And that's pretty much how they rate, uh, you know, um, identify the tires. And three, the three types that our book goes through is type three, type seven, and type eight tires. A type three tire, which is kind of pretty much shown right here, um, basically small light aircraft, general aviation for the most part. Um, and by being a type three tire, the unique thing is, is how tire sizes run. Um, some people may be familiar with automobile tires that pretty much if you have an automobile tire, um, I'm just going to go through it real quick. Um, anybody have a tire size in mind? Gosh, I don't know. Uh, no, I can tell you mine. 245, 45. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, why did that happen there? Why did my thing miss up? Okay. Well, I'll do it up here. A 245, what was it? 60? 45. 45? Yeah, R20. R20. Okay. Um, the 20 here is the rim diameter. Okay. 245 is the width of the tire in millimeters, okay? And anybody know what the 45 is? That's like the sidewall, right? Okay, that's the sidewall, but it's actually a percentage of the width. So the sidewall, the height of the tire from the rim to the top of the tire is 45% of the width. 245. Huh. And this is why, if you ever notice, like I'm trying to do this, here's the rim and here, you know, here's the sidewall of the tire. If you get a, say, a 60, this is really high. A 45 or a 20, it's like a little rubber band. Low profile. Low profile. You got it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Try to get rid of that. Um, what's crazy is, how do I say, it? when I was a kid, what? Back in my day. Back in my day, as your dad would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, my, so we would my say it all the time. 50, like we would say, oh, what, what are you running? Oh, I got 60s on the back, you know, or 50s. That actually represented the width of the tire. And 50s were wider than 60s, you know, type thing. Uh, I digress. My boyfriend brags about bigs and littles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What, I, obviously, one's bigger than the other, but I don't yeah. know what size that is. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, <clears throat> with our type three, the type three tire gives a size, uh, I'll just say like, it'll say 6.00 by six, okay? The first number is the width of the tire. And the second number six is the rim diameter. So we don't know the actual diameter of the tire, meaning from top to bottom, but we know that this tire would be six inches wide that's where it's 6.00, and it would fit on a six inch rim. So we don't know sidewall size. We don't know the sidewall size. We don't know the total diameter of the rim, or total diameter of the tire. Yeah, but you know, um, tires on an airplane are not like tires on a car. Meaning so Standard. People people like to change their tires and have different you know shapes you know profiles and all this other stuff. On an aircraft, pretty much, you know, it is stated um, this is the tire you to use, and so we don't need a whole lot of other information except that okay, we're using a six inch wide by a six 
for a six inch rim. And the tire profile and dimensions are generic then for that. Okay. Okay. And yeah. that's a type three. A type seven tire, okay. It now, um, generally on larger aircraft and stuff like that, but their numbers, what does the book say? Ah, okay. They'll say something like, oh, it's a 38 by 13 tire, okay? And what that gives us is the diameter, 38 would be 38 inches from top to bottom. And the 13 is, ready? Is, I'll just put the width, is the width of the tire. Notice it does not tell us the rim size. Okay, once again, um, the reason is, is because if you're using a type um, seven tire and, you know, it calls out for a 38 by 13 tire, type seven, the rim diameter for that tire is already a given. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I mean, I know it's, it is what it is. Okay, so it only gives the diameter and the width of the tire. Is it always diameter first? In this case, yes. But in the other one, it gave the width of the tire and the rim diameter. It did not give us the tire diameter. Oh. Yeah. And so now here it's saying, okay, this one gives us the diameter and the width, but it doesn't give us our rim size. Now a type eight tire, okay. Gives us all three. So their, for, their measurement is um, in the book, it goes a 30 by 11.5 um, by 14.5. So this is the diameter, this is the width, and then that's for the rim. And those are for high speed performance jet aircraft. Wasn't that exciting? Yeah. yeah that was really, <laughs> really exciting. All right, I'm continuing on. Okay. okay. Um, there's now what's called on the side of the, on the sidewall, all tires will have what's called a ply rating, okay? And a ply rating, it might say like five ply. Now, in the early days of tire manufacturing, that actually implied that there was five reinforcing plies in that tire. Okay. And so what are we talking about is see right. where it says here plies. These are these plies right here. It's the reinforcement of the tire. Okay. And if the tire was made with five plies, it was known as a five ply tire. If it had 10 plies, it was known as a 10 ply tire. Keep in mind that the more plies, the stronger the tire was. Now, why wouldn't they make every tire exactly the same and super strong or whatever? Well, wait, um, you know, in small general light aircraft, a lot of times we get by with three ply, four ply type tires. Um, when an aircraft is heavier than that, that tire needs to be much stronger and thus five, 10, 12 ply tires are then used. Now, I said originally that when the tires were originally built, the number of plies was indicated by the sidewall. So a five ply tire had five plies. Well, what happened? Our materials got be better and stronger. For example, um, Kevlar was first developed for automobile racing car tires. Um, and as we know, Kevlar is really, really strong. Well, Originally, they used to use cotton and polyester, which was much weaker. So this is just an example. Today, we could have one ply actually in the tire, but that one ply is as strong as five plies. So 
instead of actually indicating the number of plies that a modern tire is made with, the ply rating is a relative strength of the tire. Basically kind of okay. saying, well, this is a five ply tire, but it might only have one or two plies, but it's as strong as an original tire that had five plies. Now, what's important about the ply rating? A um, couple things. One, does the ply rating on the sidewall of a modern day tire actually indicate the number of plies? And the answer is no. Does the ply rating indicate the relative strength of the tire? And that is true. Now, what's also important about it is this. Um, like I said, we could have a 606 tire that is three ply, four ply, five ply, you know, different ply ratings. This is where we have to make sure that we go to the maintenance manual and parts manual to verify that um, what type of tire is required for the aircraft and specifically the ply rating. So if the aircraft, let's say, um, requires a five ply tire, the minimum ply rating that we can put on that aircraft is five ply. If we put, we can always put on a greater ply rating, but we can't put less than the minimum requirement for that aircraft. Are we good there? Yeah. Thank you, Kayla. I appreciate you speaking. All right. You're going to get tired of my voice. Nope, not at all. All right. Um, I'm just looking because I want to see where they're. See, they talk about the sidewall there. Um, now, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the sidewall and what is imprinted on the sidewall. Okay. For example, the side, the type of tire, like um, on the sidewall, we're going to have type of tire. Is it a type three, a type seven, a type eight? Um, it's going to give us the size of the tire, as we said, depending upon the type determines the numbers of the size of what it's giving us. Is it just giving us the section width and diam rim diameter, or is it giving us the diameter and section width, or is it giving us all three information? Okay, so type of tire, the size of the tire, the ply rating of the tire, Okay, it will also tell us, and this, this one's tricky, ready? If it's tube or tubeless type tire. Okay. Now, here's the crazy thing, ready for this? If it's a tube type tire, the word tube will not be on the sidewall. And the reason is this, when aircraft tires were first being made, all the aircraft tires had tubes. So they figured, why do we need to put on the word tube on the sidewall if all the tires are tube type? Well, what happened? Over time, they created a tubeless type tire, which does not have an inner tube. So they said, wow, we need to distinguish a tubeless type tire from a tube type tire. So they put the word tubeless on the sidewall. So a lot of T words, right? So a tube type tire does not have the word tube on the sidewall, but a tubeless type tire has the word tubeless imprinted on the tire sidewall. So let me ask you a question. Ready, Kayla? Yep. How can you identify a tube type tire? It won't say tube or tubeless. Very good. It will not indicate it being a tubeless tire, okay? How can we identify a tubeless type tire? 
It'll be printed on the sidewalk. It'll be printed on the side. Very good. Okay. Um, it's the other thing motorcycle. that will be on the sidewall is a TSO number. Has anybody ever heard of a TSO? No, not me. Maybe okay. someone else. TSO stands for Technical Standard Order. Um, or type certificate order, technical type certificate order. Um, these are regulations that the government puts out um, for tires, really for almost everything, safety wise and stuff like that, that they have to meet certain requirements. Um, I'm going to go back to when we were in uh, sheet metal and we checked the internal furnishings <coughs> and I had to do the AD on the seat tracks and that, but uh, the seat belts in the aircraft actually have to have a tag on them that has a TSO number and the TSO number for seat belts is C22. Um, indicating that the seatbelt meets that technical standard order or that type certificate order. Okay. Um, if it doesn't have that, that it doesn't, you know, theoretically it does not meet and therefore it's an unapproved item. Okay. So it, it gets a little complicated sometimes that not only do um, things have to meet FAA requirements, but they also have to meet TSOs. All right. Also, what's on the sidewall is, you know, who's the manufacturer. So the manufacturer, the TSO number, the type of tire, the size of the tire, the ply rating, and if it's tubeless, the word tubeless will also be on the sidewall. Okay. Now, um, I talked with a few students about this and that is tire pressure. If you look at your automobile um, tire, you will notice that it will have imprinted on it. It will say like max pressure. I don't, I'm just going to say 40 pounds. Okay, whatever. Um, understand that just because your tire on your car says max pressure to be 40 pounds, it does not mean that is the proper tire pressure for your vehicle, okay? Um, does anybody know where to find the tire pressure for your vehicle? Kayla? I think my car actually has a chart on the door, so. Very good. One of the easiest ways to find it is um, on the driver's side door jam, there's a um, little sticker there that will tell you what the tire pressures should be. Yeah, and and keep in mind, it will indicate what the front tire pressure is and the rear tire pressure. Um, many cars, they're equal all the way around, but not always. You could have two different yeah. tire pressures, one in the, for the front, one in, for the back. And that's basically because of the weight distribution. Many times the front tire pressure will actually be heavier or higher than the rear um, because of the engine and carrying more weight, okay? Now, aircraft tires, uh, you know, I'll just use the word um, or say, it will not have a maximum pressure on the sidewall imprinted on it. Um, you know, yes, there's always an exception to the rule. Every now and then you might see one, but, um, they do not put, for the most part, they do not put a tire pressure on the sidewall. Same reason, or well, for the reason that um, they don't want people or mechanics to believe that this is the tire pressure that is for that aircraft. The tire pressure for a tire is found in the service manual of the aircraft and must be followed, okay? And again, from the mains to the nose wheel, um, it, those tire pressures can be different from the mains to the nose wheel, okay? The reason why is because, for example, a small tire, you know, I'll just stick with like general aviation because 
such a wide range of aircraft fall in that category. A specific tire um, could be used for, say, a Cessna 152, which is a very light single engine aircraft, but that same tire could also be used on a much heavier aircraft, such as a twin engine, you know, um, Piper. And so the heavier the aircraft, the tire pressure would be designed to handle the weight of that particular aircraft. Okay. So tire pressures are normally not found on the sidewall. Are we good there? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we talked about tube or tubeless. Oh, there's something else with tube and tubeless tires, right? A tube type tire has a smooth inner liner. Okay. Um, I know it like when we were doing our tires the other day, um, it, when we took out the tube and stuff like that, if you felt the inside, it doesn't feel super slick, but they say that a tube type tire has an inner liner that's smooth or relatively smooth. And the reason for this is to help prevent chafing and wear of the tube rubbing up against the inside of the tire. Now, a tubeless type tire also has an inner liner. And that inner liner is designed to act as a tube to you know, hold in the gas. But because there's no tube, the tubeless type tire's inner liner can be left rougher and is not smoothed out as much as a tube type tire. So if you see one of the quiz questions or on the final, you might see a question that says, you know, a tube or a tubeless type tire, which has a smoother inner liner? And the answer is a tube type tire, okay? Um, under tire construction, you know, how do I say this? Majority of the time, people look at tires and, you know, it's an everyday thing. We don't really think too heavily about the construction of that tire, okay? But there is a huge amount of science and engineering that goes into the tire. You can actually see um, just in here that, you know, in what's called the bead area, okay, this is the part that goes up against the rim. Um, there's actually wire beads or steel cable, if you will, um, to prevent that tire from being removed from that rim. And this is one reason why we need to have a multi-piece rim, because there's no way we're going to be able to um, pry those steel cables over the high lip of the rim, okay? And then around the cables, we have these what's called flippers, okay? And that's pretty much to protect the plies. And then we have what's called ply turnups and then chafing strips, you know, because this is the bead seat area and the rim is rubbing up against the rubber, but just in case we don't want it to affect the actual plies. Now with the plies, okay? For a very long time, um, automobile tires and car tires, or automobile and car tires, same thing. Car tires, <laughs> aircraft tires, and that used what was known as bias ply tires. Okay. Now, I will say that a lot of small general aviation aircraft still use bias ply tires. Okay. But our book, sorry to say, does not talk about the other type of tires, okay? Commercial jet aircraft and that, um, your automobile generally use what's called a radial ply tire. Now, what's the difference between a bias ply versus a radial? Well, I know it's a little hard to see, but can you see the lines going this way here? and here, but the other layer in between is going on a different angle, okay? So pretty much they're at 45 degrees, 
Does that kind of make sense? And then the other ones alternate the other 45 degrees. If you remember when we did composites, when we were in aircraft coverings, we talked about the bias. The bias means at an angle, roughly 45 degrees, okay? Um, and so many of our general aviation aircraft are still bias ply. Um, you know, old cars used to use bias ply tires, but nowadays um, our cars are almost strictly radials and large aircraft. Well, what's the difference? Radial plies, instead of the threads running at an angle, radial plies, the threads all run the same direction from bead area to bead area. And that's known as a radial ply tire. Now, why, for example, in cars, did we go from bias to radial? And same thing with large aircraft. A bias ply tire, when you air it up, it will be kind of rounded at the bottom. And so the surface contact is really at a narrower spot, okay? Um, where a radial ply tire, if here's, will sit square on, say, the ground. So you have more contact and such, okay? and better handling because you have a wider footprint making contact with the ground. I don't know if she's here. Christina, are you there? Um, Christina contacted me earlier um, because this morning, Sorry to say, but D2L was closed. Um, I don't know who put in the dates, but they had that this class ended um, basically yesterday. <laughs> so I was like, what the, why did she say that? Yeah. And so I went in and seen that it said closed. So I had to adjust the dates and stuff once again. Anyways, um, does anybody know what type of vehicle that's on the road? that still primarily uses bias ply tires? Well, I have no idea. Someone else has to know. Okay, you looking at the screen? I am. What did I just write? Motorcycles. Motorcycles, right? Generally will use bias ply tires. Um, as we talked about, you know, motorcycles or riding a bicycle or, you know, or a motorcycle, you know, when we go to turn, do we actually turn the wheel or uh, do we kind of lean? Lean. We lean. So can you see that a bias ply tire works really good for when you want to lean into a turn? Okay. Yeah. You try to learn lean with a radial, <coughs> you can have some problems. And you can get both tubeless and tube tires too. Like my my sport, oh, yeah. sport bike has yep. tubeless, and my Honda Shadow had a tube. Oh, did it? Yeah, because it had the spoke wheel. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would make sense. Okay, um, but that's the difference between the bias and the radial. Yeah, um, I could talk more if you really really wanted to, but um, large jet aircraft now. Um, have gone to radial ply tires for the fact that there's better contact, surface contact, and um, that they last longer and stuff like that because we just don't have a small contact area. All right, next I'm going to talk about the sidewall of the tire, okay? And that's basically this part right here, the construction of the sidewall. Now, um, I'm going to get rid of some of this drawing because all right, the sidewall of the tire, right? Which one? Now, there's a difference between aircraft tires and automobile tires. 
And one of the big difference is the stiffness of the sidewall, okay? <clears throat> um, I usually ask the question, between a car tire and an aircraft tire, which one do you believe would be made stiffer than the other, as far as compatible size and stuff like that? Aircraft? Yeah, it seems like aircraft should have a stiffer sidewall. Yeah. Um, why would you think that, Taylor? Because I feel like the tires are smaller than on a car for... Well, <laughs> that figures, some of our tires are, say, 38 inches in diameter. Okay, well, in comparison to like a car, I feel like for a car-sized airplane or weight of a car, the tire is smaller. Okay. For the weight that it supports. But we're kind of talking about the stiffness of the sidewall. And I think what you, and I don't want to lead you into it, but since an aircraft weighs a hell of a lot, especially a large aircraft, it weighs a um, hell of a lot more than a car. Yeah. And thus the sidewalls need to be stiffer to support. Right. It. Okay. Right. And that, that makes total sense. And of course, you know, I'm talking about it. So a car tire sidewall is made much stiffer than an aircraft tire. Oh, okay. I was okay. thinking the other way around. Okay. No, I, I know. And that's why I bring it up. Mm -hmm. Now, why is this? Okay. The reason is this. It doesn't need to flex as much. Very good. Okay, when they land. Well, okay. well, it doesn't have to flex as much. I. Okay. What doesn't have to flex as much? The tire itself. For a car? Yeah. Okay. Well, we make the sidewall stiffer on a car, so it can't flex as much. Okay. Okay. Here's the thing. The flexing of a tire, um, and I pointed out this picture for the fact that you can see the sidewalls trying to bulge out. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever noticed a if you've ever had low pressure in your car tire, that when you're sitting there, you walk up to your car and you go, ooh, that tire looks low. Why? Yeah. Because the sidewalls are bulging out, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if you look at top of the tire, the top of the tire ain't bulging out. It's on the ground. Right. Portion, okay? Well, just think, when you're driving, the tire is, you know, getting spread out. And then as it rotates, it comes back in, okay? So the sidewalls are continuously moving as you drive. Right. Well, that builds up a huge amount of heat. And that heat, because like, think about it. If you took a piece of wire and you kept on bending it, eventually it gets hot, it work hardens, and it's gonna break. Yeah. <clears throat> the same thing happens with the tire. Okay. If the sidewalls, were made as soft as an aircraft tire, okay? The flexing of that tire would cause so much heat that the tire will fail eventually, you know, and fail quicker. So with proper tire pressure, the sidewalls are made stiffer so there's less deflection, thus keeps the tire running cooler. Okay. On an aircraft, um, having such stiff sidewalls means additional weight to the tire. And as I've said throughout the whole term, weight costs us money. So we want to make those tires as light as possible. Right. And then people go, well, yeah, but they're going to flex and it's going to cause deterioration. And yes, that is true. Yeah, but, but you don't drive around on those tires. Right. It's not like an airplane generally is flying around in the air. Right. We taxi relatively at a very slow speed. Mm -hmm. The only high speed we have is when we take off and when we and come land. to land. Yeah. And if you think about it, um, I'll, I'll say that most runways are under two miles long, which yeah. would be 10,000 feet runways. That's pretty damn long runway. I agree. But, um, less than two miles. So, okay, let's see. We taxied over to the runway and we took off. So yes, we went from zero to a hundred within that two miles and we're up in the air 
in less than two miles. That tire did not get a whole lot of revolutions, if you will. Okay. Right. It's not building up. Come into like land once again. Yeah. We come in. Yes, it has to take the impact of the landing, but that's why we also have the oleo struts to absorb that, right? Um, yeah. We got the braking and stuff, but it's a very short period of time for us to land, decelerate, and stop, and then taxi. And thus, we don't really need the sidewalls to be much stiffer, you know, or as stiff as an automobile. That's always on the road, always de deflecting. Right. Okay. And going a lot faster. What does? The, on the car tires, we're going faster all the time. Uh, no. Than a plane taxiing. Oh, yeah, than a plane taxiing, true. But, you know, our, um, our tires many times, oh, here's a good one, the space shuttle. Um, I know it's been a very long time since the space shuttle's been around, but I'm sure if everybody's familiar with the space shuttle. It would take off and then glide back to Earth and land like an airplane. Okay? Right. Those tires were rated at somewhere 250 to 300 miles an hour. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a little bit faster than most car tires. That's pretty fast. Yeah. Oh, here's a question. The space shuttle, um, the tires, were they solid rubber tires or were they pneumatic tires? Now, keep in mind, it has to go to outer space where there's no pressure. They got to be solid. Okay. Now, you know why I'm asking this question, right? Yeah, no. Because it seems very <laughs> obvious that it should be solid. Yeah. And why would you say that they should be solid? Because once they move up in the atmosphere and up in altitude, they're going to lose pressure anyway. Well, no, no. But if we go to outer space, they might blow up, right? Because there's no outside pressure. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, but here's the thing. The tire pressure, um, somebody can look it up if you want, but I'm just going to use the pressure of 200 PSI. Let's say the space shuttle tire pressure is 200 PSI. That's, say, on the ground, we pressurize it. Understand, this is what's called gauge pressure. That is pressure above ambient pressure. Our ambient pressure is what? What's ambient pressure? But yeah, what's standard atmospheric pressure in PSI? Oh, um, Look on the board. 15. 15 PSI, okay? So that's what's called 15 PSI is our, uh, is our atmospheric pressure standard day. If we put 200 PSI in here, we're fighting against the 15 PSI. So inside, if we go, let's say, and I'll do it this way. If the space shuttle went up and an astronaut got out of the space shuttle, took a tire pressure and measured the tire pressure in outer space, it would be 215 PSI because that's what's called the absolute pressure. Okay. When you come into land, it's now 200 because we had 15 PSI pushing into the tire. And so that's the 200. When there's no outside pressure, it would rise to 215. Okay. If, a, if a tire could handle 200 PSI, it can handle 215. Okay. Kind of makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. So no, they used pneumatic tires. Huh. All right. I digress. I'll keep on going. All right. So um, we're talking about the tread, right? And the tread of the tire is, of course, the part that hits the ground, right? Hopefully. Um, and pretty much the tread is there so that it can grip the ground so that we can, you know, stop the aircraft and that we can turn the aircraft and that we do not skid or slide, okay? Now, for the different types of tread. Now, the first one, and this ain't the first one, by the way, the first one is called a plane, okay? A plane or smooth tread. 
That is a tire that has no grooves on it at all. Just a piece of rubber, okay? Shopping cart wheel kind of is a plain tread. Plain tread has no tread. Now, this one, the lines in it, like so, that's known as a rib tread, okay? This one's special because it has these cutouts on the side. And so this tire would say that it has an all weather tread. Now, you probably can see that the tread design on an aircraft tire is a lot less complicated than say an automobile tire. And the main reason is this, the tire is only needed to kind of disperse water, maybe a little bit of snow, but not a whole lot. And the reason is because the runways are so designed to shed water, okay? So if it's raining, um, there's grooves in the runway, um, they're sloped in certain ways so that we don't really have a lot of puddling and the water will shed off the runway, okay? If there's snow and such, um, generally, we, you know, just like if anybody lived up north, there's crews that go out and clear the snow and ice from the runways. And so we don't need an all terrain or type of tire and stuff like that. Um, the more tread that you have, okay, or the more grooves, which are called seeps, um, you have the less rubber you have contacting the ground. And for maximum braking and friction between the wheel and the ground, the more rubber we want on the on the ground. Um, you know, so a lot of times, you know, the idea is this. If you had a dragster, right, you put on what is referred to as slicks, right? And that way you have all the rubber contacting the ground so that you got maximum traction. Now, if you drive around in your normal car on normal roads with slicks, you, it, you, it's gonna be really slick. You're going to do what's called hydroplaning and yeah. that's because the roads are not smooth, right? We have rocks, we got debris, um, you know, and so any water that gets there, we're going to do what's called hydroplaning, where we're actually floating or, you know, not gripping on top of the water. Yeah. Okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> one more before break. Um, so we talked about the plane, the rib tread, the all weather, right? Uh, by the way, there's the rib tread. Now, I showed you this yesterday. And that is, for example, on the 727, the nose wheel has a rubber deflector molded into the sidewall of the tire. And this is known as a chine. Okay? Chine, and true. the chine is there to deflect um, water, snow from the aircraft. If there's areas of concern that, you know, if you know, in cold weather, if we're spraying up water into the flaps or into the wheel well areas and that, then that um, water could freeze and turn to ice and cause problems. So this is why there's chines. Now, not all aircraft have chines, but if necessary, um, they could have a single chine, for example, this one. And as I showed you on the nose wheel of the um, 7-2, you know, it had the landing gear truck here, and then the other tire had a chine coming out the opposite way. Um, if it's a single wheel, yes, the single wheel could even have a double chine. Are we good there? Is the is a nose wheel tire the only one that's going to have a chine? I know I asked you why yeah. the other one didn't before. Um, but... No, um, main wheels can also have chines. It's, it's all depending upon how the configuration is. And if the engineers have decided that the aircraft requires chines or not. 
would you ever see a chine on a car tire is that no. something they do no no i i've never seen it i mean okay yeah okay all right cool all right um all right it's good time for a break we're going to take our break and we're going to go into then the tire inspection and inflation and such all right oh i have one more question real fast i know you said about the x's on the tire before this one right um i saw another tire when you were showing the type like seven and the type five there was some more markings on the side i was curious why they had the line yeah that one yeah nothing special <laughs> no reason no no okay and then the one that you just had up just now after the chine that one also has some markings on the right. side is there just for those seat. right um pretty much the same i mean if you really think about it how much can they do okay yeah right but the main thing is is if you look here right how yeah. it's hitting the ground so if there's any water or whatever you know here they're just say there's water on the road or on the runway water is going to try to get into that groove right so okay. that the rubber can make contact okay. if this was solid say without those right um the water could theoretically get trapped oh so, okay i understand or here it gives little spaces for the water to be squirted out the side so we don't hydroplane okay all right cool thank you no problem all right bob's going to be taking a break and i'll be back in approximately 10 minutes okay
All right. Um, we are now talking about tire inspection on the aircraft and specifically inflation. Um, understand that running a tire at the proper inflation is what we need to do, um, be it on an airplane or even on your car. Running a tire overinflated is not good for the tire because mainly that the center portion of the tire will wear faster than the shoulders of the tire. As, sorry, I thought it was there. Um, as we can see in this picture, oh, where is it? Right there, okay? So the center portion of the tire will wear more than the shoulders. And thus, once that happens, Oh, there. Uh, there it is. Okay, sorry. Um, the other one was totally worn out. Um, the problem with this is if the center of the tire starts to wear more, and that's the contact area, then you're going to lose traction um, as the tire wears and such. Um, overinflated, like I said, it's not good for the tire. Proper inflation so that we have even wear. Now, as although overinflated is bad, underinflated is much worse. Underinflated tires are going to wear more on the shoulders of the tire, okay, one. But the main problem is an underinflated tire is going to flex a lot more than a properly inflated tire. And this can cause excessive heat buildup that will you know, destroy the tire internally. Um, in many cases, and I'll give you an example here, that um, I'm sure we have all seen um, tire remnants, um, a lot of times known as road gators. You know, you yeah. see the thread of a tire, um, mainly a truck tire that mm -hmm. has or is on the road, right? We've all seen that, right, Kayla? Mm -hmm. Okay. I sure um, have. Do you know what why that has happened? Why did that tire come apart like that? Um, I don't know the reason why. I just know it's okay. Okay, a lot of people think it's because um, that the tire was what's known as a recap. Have you ever heard of a recap, Kayla? No. Okay, a recap basically is when the tread wears away, um, but the carcass of the tire is still good. So what they do is they put on new tread, new rubber on the outside of the tire. Oh, okay. I know what you mean. Okay. They take an old tire and they put new tread on top. They just blew it on. Right. Now, what's crazy is um, retreaded tires are perfectly fine. Um, retreaded tires in aviation is used all the time. Okay. Okay. What's crazy is that retreaded tires a lot of times will last longer than a brand new tire, um, mainly because of the compounds that they use. The retreaded tire is actually has generally a harder rubber and more wear resistant than the original rubber that the tire was made out of. Okay. Mm. But there's generally a misconception that people believe that truck tires, when they see that tread you know laying there on the side of the road or whatever that oh those damn retreaded tires and such and that's really not the cause that it was a retread what it is is that the tire got low in pressure okay and because it got low in pressure now it, it's sometimes i'll say it one way and then i'm going to say it another in that <coughs> You think of an 18 wheeler hauling really heavy loads. If one of the tires gets low, it's not supporting its weight, but let's say it's deflecting a hell of a lot. The heat builds up and this is what makes that tire then fail and it starts to separate, okay? Now, a lot of times it isn't the tire that got low, it's the tire that's next to the tire that's low because now the tire that's properly inflated is carrying the whole load. And so more stress is put on that one tire than the low pressure tire. 
And so that's the tire that fails first. <laughs> Okay. But it's generally caused when you see all those things, it's because a tire was being operated underinflated. Okay. Are we good there? Yeah. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about tire inflation. Okay. Now, um, as we already said, the tire pressure is not going to be on the sidewall of the tire. Where do we find it? We find it in the maintenance manual. Now, the maintenance manual, and I'll use the numbers that the book talks about, okay? Um, it says if the service manual says 187 PSI, that would be for a commercial jet, okay? Um, then this is for a wheel that's under load or a loaded tire, meaning that it's on the aircraft and the weight is on the wheels. Why do we do this rather than an unloaded tire? Well, if you ever wanted to check the tire of your car, let's say, and your tire pressure is supposed to be 35 PSI, if that was for an unloaded tire, to check it properly, you would have to jack that tire up off the ground to check the tire pressure. That would not make any sense to do. So we want to know the operating pressure of that tire, meaning the weight is on the wheels. Now in aviation, we do the same thing. We wanna be able to go to the aircraft and measure the tire pressure with the weight on the wheels. And if we need to increase or adjust the pressure to the proper pressure, we can do so while the tire is loaded. Now, in some cases, tires are you know, overhauled and, you know, built up and aired off the aircraft. Well, the problem is if we were to put 187 pounds of pressure in that unloaded tire, when we put it on the aircraft and then load it, because of the compression on the tire, the tire pressure will increase, okay? So they say that if for an unloaded tire, if you were going to air this one up, you should put in 180 pounds of pressure because it's going to increase 4%, okay? Now, I don't like how it says in the textbook because it says is 180, 4% less than 187. It's not 4% less than 187, by the way. If you actually do the math, how you would do the math is we want to know at what lower pressure, 4% more would be 187. So we take 187 and we divide it by 1.04 because, and it comes out to be 179.8. But if you take 180 and you increase the pressure by 4%, you would multiply it by 1.04 to get the 187. Um, it's just a little math thing that I get picky on, but um, it, so we got to calculate what it is, you know, what pressure we need so that a 4% increase would give us our rated amount, say 187. Okay. Um, and we'll be talking about when you inflate the tire, um, say off the aircraft and that, we want to use what's known as a tire cage so it doesn't blow up and kill us. Okay. Now, the other problem in tire inflation is temperature, okay? Um, our book tells us that for every, um, where is it? It's 1% for every five degrees in temperature change, okay? What does that mean? Well, um, if we have a 20 degree drop in temperature, okay? like from 100 to 80, we would have a 4% decrease in pressure. Now they give us an example in the book. It says that um, if a tire is inflated and allowed to stabilize with a pressure of 180 PSI in a shop where the temperature is 70 degrees and the airplane is rolled outside where it remains overnight with a temperature of zero degrees, meaning it's freezing. So we're talking about somewhere, say, I'll, I'll just say Michigan, okay? 
if if it goes outside that's a 70 degree drop in temperature we divide that by five and that's 14 percent change in pressure or about 155 psi which is well under inflated um i'll give you an example most cars now have a tire pressure sensor or tps has anybody ever noticed that um, especially during the winter time in Florida, you know, when it gets all the way down to 60 degrees. Um, <laughs> sometimes you'll get in your car early in the morning, let's say, to come to school on time. And you, you start the car. <laughs> yeah, Kayla's laughing. She goes, well, I wait till it warms up, then I leave. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but have you ever noticed you turn on your car and your tire pressure sensor light is on? Yep. Okay. And, yeah. and, and you do what? And you go, oh, well, I'll, 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 I'll check it later. And you start driving and what happens? The light goes off. Because you heated it up as you started driving. Right. And why did it heat up? Because of friction. No, because of, the, well, because of the flexing of the tire. Flexing of the tire. Yeah. Because it was low pressure. So it flexed more creating more heat, which then heated there to bring you back up to the proper pressure. Okay. okay. Um, but that's an example of how temperature can affect tire pressure. Now on aircraft, it can be really, really serious because let's say an aircraft is stationed in Miami, right? Or Fort Lauderdale and the tire pressure, um, what do they say? I'm trying, okay, still 187. PSI, but it's going to fly now to the Detroit Met Metropolitan Airport in the middle of winter, and the, it's going to have a 60 degree drop because it's 100 in Miami, and it's going to be 40 degrees in Detroit, okay? Keep in mind, what's going to happen? Well, that 187 is going to now be what, um, 60, 12% uh, lower. So what we need to do is increase the tire pressure at Miami by 12%. So we're gonna increase the pressure from 187 to 210 PSI. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, can the tire handle that? Is that something that- Oh yeah, no, the, the tires are generally rated for four, at least four times its rated pressure. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a good video on them blowing up a tire. That should be one of the videos for you to watch. Okay. And the guy talks about that the tires have, you know, well, destructive tested. Um, they test the tire to make sure that it can exceed the um, maximum, well, not the max, well, the maximum pressure by about four times. Okay. okay. So like a lot of tires that are rated for 200, 250 PSI, um, they will test the tire and it has to handle say 800, 900 PSI before it blows up. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the small increase is met. Now, the biggest thing is this, going from Miami, like I said, a hot weather climate to a cold weather climate, generally we have to adjust the tire pressure to the colder climate. <laughs> you don't want to land with low pressure. Right, exactly. What if now, it's the other if, way around? If the same aircraft was in, say, Detroit and now going to Miami, right. what would they air their tire to? Well, they would put it at 187, okay? Right. Now, when they come into Miami, it's hotter. So the tire it's pressure higher. will be increased but it will be increased to 212. It's, you know, if we kind of look at it, we might run it, say, and I'm going to say overinflated, but it's still within specs of the tire. Okay. Okay. The thing that we never want to do is operate the tire underinflated okay. because underinflated creates additional wear and tear on the tire, sidewalls and construction, and an increase in, you know, temperature of that tire. Right. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So we did that. 
Um, oh, there's one more thing. Um, and this happened more on older tires that the reinforcements were nylon, but it's a good idea no matter what. And that is, if you have a brand new tire and you air it up, um, understand that now that tire is finally under pressure, it will stretch. And the older tires used to stretch a lot more than our newer tires with new types of reinforcement. So they specifically talk about nylon tires that once you inflate the tire, you want to um, wait approximately 24 hours and then test the tire pressure once again and adjust it because the pressure will drop about five to 10 percent over you know over that 24 hours just due to the tire being stretched out and so then we want to adjust um, and then recheck every 12 to 24 hours until the pressure stabilizes within that tire okay. all right um, as we said, here's a normally worn tire. We can see how the tread is even throughout, okay? A overinflated tire will have center wear, which as we talked about already, um, reduces traction and more likelihood to skid. Um, here is a tire that was operated underinflated. Um, and as you can see, we still have tread in the very center, but on the shoulders, it has worn excessively. And then just a damn worn out tire. Now, I had mentioned about recaps, okay? And for example, where I worked, and yes, it was general aviation, but still goes true with airline. And that is whenever we seen the tire that started to wear and got to its minimum, that's when we want to remove and replace that tire. And if if we can avoid now, sometimes you know somebody had you know comes in and locks up the brakes, skids and whatever, you know, and can get into the carcass itself or the undertread. Um, those tires are generally non acceptable for being retreaded. So what we used to do is when we would take the tire off the aircraft, we would actually look at the tire to see if it was a candidate for retread. And that is that the um, tread is not excessively worn, that the under tread or the reinforcement tread is not shown, that the sidewalls don't have any big cuts or scrap, you know, that they're in very good shape. Um, and because every tire that we sent out to be retreaded, no matter if it could or could not be retreaded, we were charged a certain amount per tire for them to inspect to say, okay. Now, let's say we sent out 30 tires to be retreaded. In many cases, um, although we did a preliminary inspection on them and we sent out 30, hoping that 30 could be retreaded, many times, let's say 20 tires came back as being able to be retreaded, but the 10 other tires could not for defects that we did not catch or could see. Um, but there is a thorough, thorough inspection that is done to the tire to be retreaded. And sometimes, you know, by the naked eye, we can't really tell that. Um, and so those 10 tires, we still paid them to do the inspection in that. So we tried to minimize sending tires that could not be retreaded because otherwise you're just throwing money away. All right. Um, <clears throat> right here. Um, is that a flat spot? Yeah, well, it's not really a flat spot. This is what's known as rubber reversion, okay? Um, Are you sitting too long? I'm, I'm just going to say, because I don't know if anybody knows this, but, you know, most tires are both natural rubber and synthetic rubber compounds put together. Um, rubber comes from the rubber tree, yep. okay? It's basically the sap of a rubber tree. Now, the problem is rubber is kind of soft and gooey and all this stuff. They do a process that's known as vulcanization of the rubber. And yes, it's from the planet Vulcan, you know, mm -hmm. from Star Trek. But <laughs> um, what it does is by high temperature and steam basically hardens the rubber. 
okay? And thus it makes it wear resistant and as we know, like what tires are. Well, here's the problem. Here comes an aircraft and water on the runway, right? And it skids or does what's known as hydroplaning, that's sliding on the water. Mm -hmm. What people don't realize is there's still a huge amount of heat that is generated because the rubber is still making some contact with the runway. And when that starts skidding, huge amounts of heat are generated and we have water. Well, when you add a lot of heat to water, it turns to a vapor called steam. Yeah. Pretty much the same way that we change the soft rubber into hard rubber. Well, in this case now we have the steam, but not the pressure and not controlled properly. And so this is why it's called rubber reversion in that we are making that hard rubber into now soft gooey rubber. Okay. If you ever see like a spot as the picture is dictating here or shows you here, um, this means that the tire has hydroplaned and we have rubber reversion and this tire needs to be removed and replaced. Are we good there? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, good. I hope that we had these. Now, this is kind of unique. If you look at the tire tread, can you see the little V cuts in it? Yeah, they look like cracks. Yeah, because they are cracks. Okay. Now, let me ask you, these have a very special name. And if, let me draw this. Anybody know Chevron. what symbol is that for what gas station? Chevron, they're Chevrons. Yeah, those little you know, angles like this, they're called Chevrons. They have markings like that on the runway too. But yeah, but those are painting. Yeah, yeah. there's still right. Chevron though. But these are called Chevron cutting. Now, what causes this is that when an airplane's coming in on the runway, you know, to land, the runway many times is grooved. Okay. Where they land. Why do we groove the runway? Because the tire doesn't really have a lot of grooves. So this helps shed the water where we're going to land. Okay, yeah, water displacement. And okay. those grooves cause the chevron cutting. Huh. All right. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Let me just, yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right, so on page 955, um, well, 954, 955, uh, they talk about the tire removal, and we have already covered that. We went, you know, I discussed it in class when we came into shop. We actually did the project as far as removal of the tire, but quickly, once again, remember when we go to remove a tire from a rim or from the aircraft, for safety reasons, what do we want to do first? Deflate, deflate it. the tire, very good, okay? Once the tire is deflated, then we can go ahead, um, remove the brakes or, you know, make the brakes where we can remove the tire from the aircraft. Um, we then remove the ax cotter pin, axle nut, remove it from the aircraft, bring it to the workbench. Um, prior to disconnecting the tie bolts, we want to break the bead seat area. Remember, we never pry against the rim itself, right? We use a bead breaker to break the bead seat area. We then can remove the tie bolts, separate the rim from the tire, and so on, okay? Um, tire repair and retreading. Um, no, you know, how do I say no? As a mechanic, you know, um, I know some people may have done this previously, and that is to use a plug kit for a tire. Like, oh, I got a nail in the tire. Hey, I bought this tire plug. And, you know, you kind of remove the um, pro projectile, that the nail that's in the tire, 
Um, and then you kind of ream that out. You put some glue on a piece of rubber kind of thing. You insert it, you know, pull it out and then you trim it um, and then air up the tire. Understand, um, no, <laughs> we don't do that on aircraft tires at all. No, no, no. And if you don't know this, it's not good for your automobile tires. Okay. If anybody's had, you know, damage to the tire as far as a puncture, um, if you bring it to somebody, they do not put a plug in it anymore. Um, the tire is removed, it's cleaned, and a patch is put on the inside, correct? Yeah, yeah I've had a patch put on my sport bike tire before. Yeah. And, and um, there's different criteria of where the puncture can be repaired. Yep. You know, um, if it's too close wall. to the sidewall, no good, and blah, 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 and stuff. Yeah. Um, I've already discussed the retreading, right? No, we don't do it ourselves. I believe I have retreading videos for you to see kind of the process that goes through it. Um, you know, they basically bring the tire in. They do a very, very thorough inspection. They use grinders and they use special tooling to scrape off all the tread portion of the tire, then they wrap it with new rubber, you know, and then they put it in a mold to impress the um, tread back onto it and all this other stuff. It's a fascinating world. <laughs> so that's retreading. <clears throat> we now talk about tire storage, okay? Um, it, it's kind of funny because most of the time, like what I'm going to tell you versus Hey, if you, anybody ever go to Costco, like the Costco Tire Center? Uh, yeah. Okay. If you ever notice, how do they store their tires? On racks? Uh, well, on racks at the front, but if you notice, they generally are stacked on top of each other, like so. Yeah. Sidewall to sidewall, right? Yeah. You've seen it. Okay. Aviation. This is kind of a no-no. <laughs> or we have very, very small limits on that, okay? If you notice, we want to store our aircraft tires on what's known as tire racks. The tire racks are not flat, but they're angled so that the tire sits like so. The reason for that is if the tire is on a flat rack, this will get a flat spot. Okay. And it won't be round anymore, okay? We also want to store it away from anything that produces ozone. Okay, ozone is an oxygen atom that's O3. Ozone is beautiful when it's up in the air to protect us from radiation from the sun. But on the ground, it's called smog. Okay, ozone, what produces ozone? Fluorescent lights create ozone. Anything that creates a spark such as electric motors, will produce ozone. And that ozone is detrimental to the rubber that the tire is made out of, okay? So you shouldn't store it in anywhere that has fluorescent lights or electrical motors running, okay? Or where there's lightning, because lightning produces ozone for the earth. Anyways, now, over time, even these angled pieces can cause flat spots. So the person that's in charge of the storeroom, um, what they should do is periodically go in there and rotate the tire like 90 degrees and thus to prevent any flat spots on the tires. Now, I said we can't stack them sidewall to sidewall. Yeah, we can, but as I said, there are limits to what we can do, okay? And I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I wanted to do that. Okay, so if you look on page 956, just above this picture, it gives us our limits, okay? It says that, if necessary, however, to stack them horizontally, meaning sidewall to sidewall, they should not be stacked more than five tires high for tires with a diameter of up to 40 inches. So we could go, uh, now I got to hit draw. One, two, 
three, four, five. We can go sure. stack up to five high if, if the tire diameter is less than 40 inches. Make sense? So you're stacking these on their side, like the side? On the side, like Costco does, okay? okay? As long as the diameter is less than 40 inches, okay? okay? If the diameter is between 40 and 49 inches, okay, then we can have to go four high. Okay. And if the diameter is greater than 49, three high. Okay. Now I know, you know, in our program, there's a lot of times, oh, you got to know these numbers. You got to know these numbers, okay? The best way to, for me to remember this is this, 40 to 49, four high, or go four is 40 to 49. Okay. If the diameter is less than a smaller tire, I can go higher, one high, more, five. If it's greater than three, make sense? Yep. All right. Um, aircraft tubes, okay? Um, when we did the project, I described the tube. I talked about, you know, careful inspection of the valve stem, right? Um, we talked about that the valve stem is generally going to be the heavy spot, but if the manufacturer has determined that there's a different heavy spot, it would be indicated by a paint stripe, generally yellow in color. Okay, um, you know, we're looking for any type of creases and stuff like that in the tube. Um, the kind of funny thing that I think is in tube inspection and storage, they tell us in the book, do not nail the tube to a wall for storage. And the reason is because you put a hole in it. Okay, but they also say, that was a joke, by the way. They say also do not hang a tube over a nail because it will create a permanent crease that will weaken the tube. Um, this really is totally outdated. And the reason is that as I was talking about suspected unapproved parts, um, pretty much everything has to be packaged individually now. So for example, at one time when we bought O-rings and let's say we bought a hundred O-rings, the O-rings would come in like a plastic bag and there would be a hundred loose O-rings in a plastic bag. Today, O-rings are individually wrapped in basically a brown packaging with the part number and all the identification of that O-ring on the outside. And so you can't even see the O-ring. You've got to open up the package to take out the O-ring. Okay, so you got to go by the part number. The same thing with inner tubes. Today, if you were to get an inner tube or purchase an inner tube, it would come in a box that is packaged that has all the pertinent information on the box. Why would you want to take it out to hang it on a nail? I do not know. You would keep it in the original packaging until you needed the tube. Okay, <clears throat> as far as tire mounting, We've already discussed that, you know, with a tube type tire, we have to be careful about the tube so that when we put the two rim halves together, that we do not pinch the tube in between. This will cause damage to the tube and eventually it will definitely leak, okay? As said, um, when we were in the shop, when we insert the tube into the tire, um, prior to so, we use what is known as tire talc. It's a silicone-based talcum. Um, these, you know, compared to the baby powder, talcum powder type stuff. Um, this then gives a slickness to prevent chafing between the inner portion of the tire and the tube itself, okay? We discussed that when we put the rim halves together and we torque, we wanna to make sure that the rim does not spin 
in the tire um, that would then put a side load on the valve stem. And we want to verify that this valve stem is straight. Okay. With a tubeless type tire, yes, it's still a multiple piece rim, but what prevents the gas from leaking out between, say, the two halves of the rim? The answer, an O-ring. Okay, so there is a place for an O-ring to go between the two rim halves, um, making sure that those are in proper order and seated properly and is in proper working condition. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and really, okay, when we go to service a tire, right, um, if we're servicing it off of the aircraft, we want to inflate it in what's known as a tire cage. Okay? Because even if we've done everything right, you know, and honestly, you know, the rims should have been in properly inspected by the non-destructive testing method, such as eddy current for the bead seed area, and that um, the bolts should have been magnetic particle inspected. Um, die penetrant inspection and in other areas and such. Um, hey, we never know when something's going to go wrong, so we want to be totally safe. Now, um, how do I say this? You know, these tires like this, when you're trying to build up to almost 200 PSI, you know, 187, 200, 210, um, a tire cage, because if anything lets loose, like the tie bolts or the rim fails, or the equipment that you're using malfunctions or by operator error or just um, equipment malfunction, that tire blows up, it can kill you. So use of a tire cage for safety, okay? As far as balancing, um, large aircraft tires definitely are um, more balanced than the small general aviation aircraft tires because, well, one, they don't spin very fast and they don't spin for very long. Um, but um, on small aircraft, we can use what's known as a static balancer. Um, basically, a static balancer, the tire is not being rotated at, say, normal speeds. Um, and then we find the heavy spot and then with the use of magnets on the outside of this disc, we can kind of position it so that we know where to add lead weight. Uh, the lead weight that we would use basically has a self-adhesive tape on it, um, and then we can place it onto the rim. Um, a lot of our automobile tires, um, they used to use, you know, and they still do on steel rims, uh, lead weights that clip onto the rim itself. Um, if you have aluminum and such, um, then generally the weights are taped on, but with an adhesive and stuck on to balance out the rim and tire. Um, operating handling and tips, uh, taxing. Whenever you're taxing, we want to taxi, you know, at a basically at a walking speed, you know, um, nice and slow, um, using the nose wheel steering or differential braking and stuff like that. And um, we've talked about taxing quite a bit. Braking and pivoting, you know, it is what it is. And folks, we are done with lecture for the term. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs>